here's off the flywheel off the mower and we have 12 ceramic magnets so you can see that's the North Pole mm -hmm. if I move over you can see that's the South Pole that's the North, South, North, South and it continues all the way around so on all these here flywheels if your magnets was to ever come loose and you had to epoxy them back in, you got to be sure that you have the north and the south alternating all the way around. And it takes two magnets to make one cycle of an AC waveform. I'm uh, measuring one of the magnets here and I've got about 1,458 gauss. So if I just move over to another one, you can see that one is about 1,669. Going to another one, about 1482. Now, here's some iron filings. So we've all seen this when we were a kid. And I have a magnet under here. And the North Pole is over here. The South Pole is over here. Now, we can see that the arrangement that the, these iron filings have made is a, is a path. You can see that you got the lines that are coming out of the North and they're coming back around to the South. They call this magnetic field lines. But in reality, they do not exist. Back, uh, back 170 years ago, when Michael Faraday discovered uh, the, that you can take magnets and, you know, using electromagnets and he made electricity, then uh, he, was, he was doing the same experiment. And he would uh, say these were the magnetic field lines. Well, even today, in computer simulations, you know, where you, you're creating these uh, models, they also have uh, the same, they use the same thing, they call them steel magnetic field lines, where in reality they don't exist. For example, if you look right here on the poles, you can see that it's strongest. In other words, uh, the magnetic strength is the strongest. You see how tight everything is in here. But what about in these areas where there's nothing? In other words, there's gaps. Say like right in here, there's gaps. Does that mean that there's no magnetic field at all in there? No, the magnetic field is continuous. It is all around the magnet. And this is just a 2D representation. So it's a 3D, this here will go 3D uh, all the way around as far as the, the magnetic field. You can think of it like if you look at uh, maps of uh, high pressure and low pressure, and you'll see the curves and the circles and everything that they draw. You'll see the high pressure area, you'll see the low pressure areas with the, with the drawings that they have. They use the same type of uh, technique that they use when they're representing magnetic field lines. So they'll draw circles. Uh, when the lines are closest together, that means that the field strength is the strongest. And when they're further apart, then it's weakest. But that does not mean that there's no magnetic field. They use these in 3D uh, simulations and models to show these magnetic field lines where they, you know, if they want some type of a particular arrangement, they will use it like, uh, say, if they wanted to look at a hallback array. So they can take these magnets, they can put them together, they can look at the, uh, the modeling of it to see how the magnetic field lines are gonna uh, react from one magnet to another to get the kind of uh, field strength that they want. Here's a brief lesson in magnetics. By all means, this is not complete, so I'm gonna try to explain what Gauss is. If I have a ball magnet, let's say, and it's three centimeters across, two centimeters deep, so this here area of the pole is six centimeters squared. Now the magnetic field lines are coming out, and they're coming out in this direction, wrapping around to the south, continuing through the magnet, and out to the north again. All right, so each one, let's say we have each one of these lines is a magnetic field line. So one magnetic field line is called a Maxwell. If I had a hundred of them coming out, then I'd say that's a hundred Maxwell. All right, and all of these together, we call that magnetic flux. Now magnetic flux is defined as the amount of area of how many, uh, and it's equal to the magnet times the magnetic flux density. So here's our little equation. We have magnetic flux, which is phi, is equal to B, which is magnetic flux density, times the area. So our area is six square uh, centimeters. Now we want to find our flux density, which is B, and we know that we have 100, 100 field lines coming out. So if we take, and we want to solve for B, magnetic flux density, that's 100 divided by six, and that's going to be 16. What that's saying is, 
in a unit area of one square centimeter, how many flux lines is passing through that one square centimeter? In this case, we have 16. That would be 16 gauss. There's a lot more to it, but that, at least that'll give you a, a brief explanation, you know, of what the, what the gauss reading means. One last thing, there's another measurement that's used to measure magnetic fields, and that's called Tesla. Tesla is the same thing, except instead of using one centimeter squared to measure the magnetic flux density, we use one meter squared. We're going to do a little experiment to show how you could take some magnets and some wire and we can create electricity. The same thing that's being done on our riding mower. Here we have a north pole, here we have a south pole, two magnets. I have a coil of wire right here. And I have it connected to a galvanometer. Now, a galvanometer is just a very sensitive meter that can measure a very small amount of current. So I have four turns of wire, as you can see. There's no battery. And if I put it in front of the magnets and I move it back and forth, can you see that the meter is moving over here? The meter? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. All right. So what what is uh, what is going to what is going to make the difference in far as in uh, how much voltage or current that we're going to be generating? If I make if I have more turns of wire, I will get more voltage. If I have stronger magnets, I will get generate more voltage. If I move the, this here faster, I will generate more voltage. Now here we're going to have a coil that has 160 turns on it. Remember I said the more turns, the more voltage. So let's just see if that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now if I go faster, then I will, get, I will also generate more voltage. The last coil had 160 turns. Here's another one. This one has 330 turns. Mm -hmm. Let's see how it looks. So you can see we're generating more current because we have more turns. Now let's go back to our original coil here, right? 160 turns. Now look, look, at the, look at the amount of deflection, okay? What else can we do to, to generate a higher voltage? Well, let's do this. We're gonna take an armature, a piece of steel, which is called an armature. We're gonna put it down inside the core. Before we had an air core. Now we have like an iron steel core. Now let's watch it now. You see how much more deflection we have? Mm -hmm. So what is happening there is that the magnetic flux is being concentrated into a more tighter area. So this here, when, when, we, when the magnetic flux is coming through, if the air is not the best, say, conductor or has a higher reluctance to this here magnetic field lines. But when we put this iron steel core in here, we take those magnetic field lines and now we are compressing them tighter together. And remember, as they get tighter together, then that magnetic flux density goes up and the field strength goes up. That goes up, same thing as having a stronger magnet. That's going to give us a higher voltage out. Okay, let's take a look at the other one here, which we had 320 turns, and let's put an iron core in that, and let's see the difference on it. Here's the uh, one with the more turns on it, just using an air core. And now I'm going to take and put an iron steel slug in here, just for a Torx fitting here. And I'm going to push them down inside the center of it. And now let's try it now. See the difference? Mm -hmm. So we just made this here stronger and then we'll get more voltage out of it. Now let's take a look at our stator that came off the riding mower. Now this here has got two leads. This is a dual circuit charging system. 
Now we can see that we got a red lead and we got a black lead. The red lead is generating AC voltage and the black lead is generating AC voltage. Now if we follow the red lead down, this is going to be the one that's charging the battery. We see there's a diode in here. We'll talk about the diode in the next video. But this here is going to take this AC and it's going to convert it to DC and that's going to be used to charge the battery. Now this here is going to be for like a 1 to 3 amp charging for the battery. Now over here on this side we see that we have the black wire which is also like I said is an AC voltage but this AC voltage is going out to power up the headlights. Alright so that can go up to 5 amps you know for, char uh, for feeding the uh, headlights. Let's take a look at the coils. We see that we have 8 coils. So we got 2 here, we got 2 here, 2 here and 2 there. Okay. Now take a close look at the coils. We see that four of the coils are wound with thicker wire. So we have this one, this one, this one, and this one. These four with the thicker wire is going to be for the headlights. We have it go up to five amps, so that's why we have a thicker wire. Then we have the other four. They're wound with a thinner wire, and this is from one to three amps on the charging of the battery. Okay. Also notice that the coils are wound, like in this particular one, you can see that it comes across and it's being wound in a clockwise direction. And then it comes down and it's now being wound in a counterclockwise direction. And it goes up and it's the same thing. So it's being wound clockwise and counterclockwise. Now if we also, if we flip this over, you can see that the two, the sets of windings for four of them, you have the coil, one wire left over, and it's going to this here uh, Torx uh, bolt right here. You can see there's two wires. One of them is thick, one of them is smaller. This is the center point between these two sets of windings. So we have eight coils, four coils is on one side, and then the other side goes to ground. You have the other four coils, and uh, that one wire, it also goes to ground. So they're being tied to ground right here, okay? So uh, also notice, as uh, relating to our demonstration, you see how we have this here, metal, that's on each coil? That's our armature. That's just like what we did earlier where we put an iron steel uh, shaft down inside of the core. This will intensify the magnetic flux density so we can generate a higher voltage. That's what this is for. And also if you look on the inside, you can see that we have an iron steel ring goes all the way around. This here gives a path of low reluctance for the magnetic flux. Since we just talked about the stator, it would be a good time to take a look at the wiring diagrams for this here charging system. And we'll start it with the stator. Uh, by the way, if you want to download these here wiring diagrams, they'll be in the description below the video. Now this here is made up of two pages. The first page that you're looking at right now is where I have it drawn in a pictorial format. Some people like to see the diagram where the components are kind of drawn like the components so it's a little bit easier to follow for them. But I also have it drawn in a ladder format which is what we're looking at now. So we're going to take a look at this here diagram and I'll go over the charging system. Now let's take a closer look at the stator. As we see the stator here, it has eight separate individual coils. The four that's on the bottom is going to be for the headlight circuits. And so we're going to be generating that AC voltage out here on the black wire to feed the headlights. There's four coils wired in series just like the four on the bottom. And these four coils are going to be used to drive an AC voltage it's going to be used to charge the battery. Now, as you can see, all of these coils are wired in series. And at the midpoint of this set of coils, we can see there's a midpoint of where it goes to ground. And of course, ground goes to the DC negative of the battery. Now, the lines up here, these two parallel lines for across each coil, represents the armature that we had already talked about a little bit earlier. So let's follow out this here full bottom coils for the headlight circuits and let's see how the uh, circuit goes and works. We can see that we're coming out here on the black wire 
and then as we go through we're coming to a connector now this connector right here is the one that is right behind the carburetor that we saw earlier in the first video of where we disconnected it to measure our AC voltage here and also up here on this uh, red wire by continuing on through it goes through the connector then it goes through the white wire and then it goes to another connector okay now this one here is right up above the cowl this is another connector and then it comes out of the connector and then it's going to go down on a white wire and it's going to go to the headlight switch comes out of the headlight switch continues to as a blue wire and then it's going to be another connector it's going to go through and this one is located right near the headlights this connector then it comes out as continue on as still a blue wire and then it's going to feed one side of the headlights now on the other side of the headlights we have a green wire passes back through the same connector and then it's going to continue out as a green wire as, as before and then it's going to come up and then it's going to be grounded at the solenoid uh, connection where it's bolted onto the frame now of course as I said earlier this ground is a DC connection back to the negative side of the battery okay so if we come up here now if you look at these other four coils that's up on the top we can see that this here is going to be going out as a red wire and you can see that it's feeding a diode now this diode we'll talk about in the next video and the purpose of it is to take the AC that's on the red wire and it's going to convert it to DC so over here on this other side of the uh, diode we're going to have a DC voltage and it's going to go through the connector and it's, this is the same connector that's behind the carburetor and then it's going to go out as a red black wire and then it's going to go through a connector it's so one right up above the cowl and then from out of the connector it continues on as a red black wire then it comes on down then it goes over through the to the ignition switch on terminal 2 now this here switch contact is going to be in a closed position when the engine is running so it's going to continue through this closed contact it's going to go internally in the in ignition switch and it's going to come out on terminal 5 and now it's going to be a red with a white tracer it's going to go to the ammeter passes through the ammeter and then it's going to continue on as a red white wire then it's going to go through the 20 amp control fuse then it's going to continue on out as a red wire the red wire will come back and it will go all the way back to the positive side of the battery so that is pretty much it as far as the wiring diagram for the charging system the dual circuit charging system all right let's get some uh, resistance measurements on this here stator all right first we're going to turn on the meter here and let's turn it over to ohms and let me give you some light here maybe that'll help a little bit Just take my meter leads, put them together. Let's go to high resolution. Let's uh, zero out my test leads. Now, first measurement uh, we're going to get is between the red wire and we're going to go to ground. And let's see what we get. We'll let it stabilize. Let's call that one 120, 121. Now let's go between the black wire and the ground. Going between the black wire and ground. Looks like we're going to have point twenty two. Now let's go between the red and the black wire. And that looks like we have 1.34 ohms. 
Okay, we are now into the alternating current. Now we saw that we can generate an AC waveform by using magnets and just coil the wire. Now we're going to go into a little bit of detail talking about this here AC waveform. We're going to look at some of the voltages and how they are being expressed. I mean, we have peak voltage, RMS voltage, we have instantaneous voltage, we have uh, average voltage, we have peak to peak voltage. Let's talk about a little bit of those. Now we're starting out, we're going to look at two axes. We have a horizontal axis, and this horizontal axis is going to be expressed as time. Time moving from left to right. We have the vertical axis, and that's going to be volts. It's going to be expressed as volts, and down here it's going to be negative volts. Now this here horizontal axis also is going to be looked at as zero volts. Now if I draw my sine wave, I'm going to do the best I can. Okay. Here's a sine wave. Also sometimes called a sinusoidal wave. And this is what's being generated from our, from our riding motor. Now, we talked about the different voltages. Let's look at the first voltage. Well, first, you can see that this voltage starts at zero, goes, up, goes to a maximum peak voltage, and then it falls down decreasing, goes to zero, but now it's going into a negative direction, and now we have another peak voltage down here. Well, we have one peak voltage up here, and of course this is not going to be positive because we're above our zero volts line, so let's just mark back that anything up here, it's going to be positive. As we fall below our zero volt line, that's going to be negative. This is going to be positive, this is going to be negative. Right? So if we have a positive volts up here that's peak at the positive point, well, of course, we have one down at the bottom. So this will be our negative volts peak. Now, so we can relate all of this stuff, and I'm going to give you some examples. In North America, receptacles, we have 120 volts RMS, and that's what your voltmeter is going to be measuring. RMS, root mean square. Okay, what does that mean? Well, the root mean square is going to be 70.7 percent .7 of your voltage peak. So wherever we go up to here, there's our voltage peak, 70.7 .7 percent. You know, we measure from zero. If we come up 70.7 percent uh, of the peak, we can say right there. Let's say it's going to be 120 volts RMS. All right. Now, what does that mean? Okay, this voltage is continuously varying all the time from zero to P. And now it's decreasing, still positive, going to zero. Now it's going in the negative direction. Well, if we could equate that to a battery, which does not vary its voltage, what would that, what would that battery voltage equate to for this here sine wave to be continuously varying? Well, what they do is if you take a heater, and you take a battery. Now let's say we take this battery and we hook it up to a heater. Now this heater is going to give us so much heat off of that. All right? Well, this is going to give us so much heat. And it's always varying. But how could we equate this here that's varying to this battery, which is going to be stable voltage? Well, it turns out that this battery voltage would be 120 volts. That, the heating effect from this here, here, is the same exact thing as this here voltage here that's continuously varying, which is at 120 volts RMS. And RMS means root mean square. Now I can show you how that's derived, but that's a little bit more involved than what we want to get into in this video. We'll save it for another time. Let's look, at a, let's look at a few things here and relating some of this here uh, voltage, RMS, peak voltage. Let's see if we can define it a little bit. Now if I take, if I take voltage, RMS, okay, and I take my peak voltage, 
and I divide it by the square root of 2, then I will get this equation to find out what VMR is, VRMS is. Sometimes you may see this equation written as this. 0 0.707, that's that 70.7% that I talked about, times the peak voltage, right? That also will get you that. How did you get this? Well, if you take 1 divided by the square root of 2, and the square root of 2 is equal to approximately 1.414, then you will get 0 0.707, and that, then you can multiply it times the voltage peak. Let's say that I want to know what is I want I want to know what voltage peak is. Well, we can come back and we can say voltage peak is if I cross multiply. Then I'm going to get the square root of two times V R M S. Now, do you remember? You remember when we was talking about V R M S? In other words, the, the uh, root mean square voltage, 120 volts. Well, what is the actual? peak voltage of that. Let's find out. If we come here and I take the square root of 2, which remember we said it was about 1.414, we multiply that times 120, and if we multiply this out, and let's see what that means. Get, if I say 1.414 1 times 120, then we get 169.68 volts. Okay? 169.68. Alright? In other words, remember we were looking at this here, right? So right there, if this here is 70.7% 70 uh, is our 120 volts, right? And that's RMS, then I'll peak voltage is going to be VP is equal to 169.68. Alright? Now, you remember we also had that other volts for peak, which is on the negative direction, which is down here. So that would be, if it's symmetrical, and it is for like, you know, the coming out of the outlets, receptacles for North America, and that would be 169.68 volts also. Now, let's say I wanted to know peak to peak voltage. Remember, that was the voltage that's from here. That would be to here. And if I want to know what is that voltage, then how would I do that? Well, then we're going to be measuring the difference in that voltage. Potential difference, right? That's what voltage is. You're measuring from one point, one voltage to another point. In all these cases, We'll be measuring, in this case, we're measuring to the neutral, right? If I measure from here to here, I should get, let's see, basically we're, getting, we're just going to take and double that, and we're going to get 169.68. I'm just going to do that in the calculator. So if I say 169.68 times 2, then I'm going to get a value of voltage peak to peak, and that's going to be 339.36. Now some people might think, well, why don't, why don't we just add those? Why don't you add those voltages together? Why do you subtract? Well, let's take a look at that. Let's see how that'll work out. Okay. So we have 339. Let me make a notation up here. Uh, 339, and here is our, here's our voltage peak. So let's get rid of some of this stuff over here. All right. Let's say we're going to do this here, voltage peak to peak. All right. Well, let's add it. Let's add it together. Some think, some people, like, you know, in the past have told me, say, hey, you should add those together. All right. Well, let's look at it. Let's see how it works. I'll take my 169.68 volts, and I'm going to add it to this here negative. 169.68 volts. And when I add that together, you can see that I am going to write this down. I have a plus and a minus. That makes this a minus. And then I'll do 169.68. And then I come back and I subtract it. What do I get? Zero volts. Now we know that's not right. So you do not add them together. Remember, 
voltages are always subtraction, potential difference. Difference means subtract. Now let's go back and let's look at it the other way. So if I go back and I write my 169.68, subtract, and then I subtract my minus 169.68 volts, and then we come back, write him down, now we have a minus and a minus, and that makes this a positive, so that'll be 169.68. And then we come back and we look, and what do we get? We add these two together, we get 339.36, okay? Same thing. So you always subtract when you want to go for your peak to peak volts. All right? Let's take a look at frequency, okay? Now, all of this stuff that we're talking about is going to be shown in a little bit later in the video of where I took some uh, AC waveforms on oscilloscope. I use a picoscope, 44 to uh, 25, and uh, so we're going to be looking at some of these waveforms, and that's why I'm going over this now so that I don't have to go re-elaborate inside, you know, looking at the waveforms. So you already be up on top of it. All right, again, we have our axis here. There's our zero volts. Of course, this is measured in time. Here's our volts positive. Here's our negative volts down here. And then we have our sine wave. Okay. All right. Okay, frequency is the amount of cycles that it takes. Give me one second. A cycle. What is a cycle? Well, look right here. I start at zero volts. I go up and I go to maximum peak. I come down, I go to zero volts, now I'm going in maximum negative, I hit peak out, and then I return, and now I'm back at zero volts again. Well, this right here, right there, is one cycle, okay, one cycle. And if I did that in one second, if it took one second to make that alternation, then that would be uh, one second to make that cycle, then that would be one, one hertz. And by the way, this right here, as I mentioned, is positive, this is negative. For this to go up, that is one alternation. When it goes to negative, that's another alternation. Two alternations makes one cycle. Now, it takes so much time for this to happen. Now, like in, uh, in North America, we're talking about 120 volts, RMS. It takes 60 cycles in one second. 60 of these here cycles, there's one. 60 of them is completed in one second. All frequency, anything with frequency is always in one second. Okay? Now, so we go up, there's one cycle. But you know what? <clears throat> that takes so much time for that to happen. Right? It takes so much time. So there's the equation. Time, which is measured in seconds, is equal to 1. Why 1? Because 1 second. And then we have our frequency. Well, we already know that frequency is going to be 60. 60 cycles in 1 second. 60 hertz. Same. All right? So now, if I take 1, frequency is 60. Well, 60. 60 cycles in one second. How many, how much time does it take to complete one cycle? Well, like I said, one second divided by 60. And if we do that, we're going to find out that we're going to get 0 0.0166. And it just keeps repeating. Now, I put a line on top of the last 6. That shows that the 6 is repeating indefinitely. We're going to round it off. And we're going to say that that is equal to 0 0.0167 seconds. Okay? Just rounding it off. And now, we can take that. If I shift my decimal point over 3 places, then we can say that it will take 16 point approximately 7 milliseconds. 16.7 milliseconds to complete one cycle. So the time from here to here is going to be 16.7 milliseconds. Now this time has a terminology that to complete 
one cycle in this amount of time is called a period. Okay. And I think, now, you know everything I know about it. All right, let's take a look at this here voltmeter, and we're going to illustrate what we've been talking about on the whiteboard where we talked about RMS voltage, we talked about peak voltage, peak to peak voltage, and frequency. So let's illustrate that here with this here voltmeter, and we're going to be looking at the uh, voltage that's coming out of this outlet. So let's go ahead and let's turn on the voltmeter to the AC function. Let's go ahead and make it a little brighter so you guys can see. As you can see, we're measuring RMS voltage right now, which is 123 volts. Now, we want to take a look at the peak voltage, say, in the positive direction. So we're going to press the min max button, and then we're going to press this here button underneath, which is peak. So we can see that we have 167.2 volts peak. Now, let's say we want to look at the peak voltage in the negative direction. So if I press the min max, you can see we have a negative 167.2 volts. Now let's say we want to look at the peak to peak voltage. I'm going to press this here button here, which is relative delta. I'm going to press it. It's going to zero it out. So now that voltage is zeroed out. And now we're going to take and press the min max. And now we have the peak to peak voltage of 334.9 volts. Now let's say that we want to take a look at the frequency. So I'm going to get out of all of this here functions that I'm in now. I'm going to go back. I'm going to press the relative delta button to get out of it. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to hold the min max in. that to clear it out. That puts us back into our RMS voltage. Now I'm going to come over here to the hertz button so we can look at the frequency. And we got 59.98 hertz. Now if I press this again, I'm going to get the duty cycle of this sine wave, which is 49.4. And if I press it again, I'm going to go back to my RMS voltage. Now as a little tip, if you want one extra digit of uh, resolution, you want a little more accuracy, if you come back down to here to the button for the light, if you hold it in, it beeps, you let go, and you get an extra digit of resolution. All right, let's take everything that we learned about AC waveforms from the whiteboard and see if we can apply it to the waveform that we're looking at here. Now, this is a, a waveform that was taken off of the stator. This is with the stator connector disconnected, and this is off of the red wire. And if you remember, this here is AC voltage that's used to charge the battery. And of course, you know, it goes through a diode. All right, so if you look over here to the left, you can see that the amplitude is lower than it is over here. Well this is when the engine was running at an idle condition and this is when it was running at a wide open condition and then it went back to idle over here. One of the things you'll notice is that as the engine the faster the engine runs the higher the amplitude the higher the voltage. Also the frequency will increase as we go to a higher sp speed. So there's a frequency here and then there's a higher frequency here because the amplitude is higher and because the RPM is running faster. And so what we're going to do is we're going to focus just on this part here because when you're doing your checks, you want to do it when a, at a wide open throttle. So we're going to focus in this area right here. Now let's take a look at the um, just take a look at the waveform so we can see what it will look like. If you take a look, you can see there's a nice sine wave. If I bring down a voltage cursor, and if I go in here and I type zero for zero volts, you can notice that the of the positive alternation here is equal in amplitude to the negative alternation. Let's go back to our full screen again. All right. Now I'm going to bring down a um, voltage cursor, and I'm going to put it right up here on the peak voltage somewhere oh I don't know about right there that looks pretty good and we have 47.86 volts now we're going to go ahead we're going to go ahead and we're going to bring in a, um, a photo a snapshot of where of the voltmeter where I took a voltage reading of this when it was running at a wide open throttle and the RPMs you can see that the tachometer is running at 3230 
All right, so we have 33.96, and our peak voltage here is 47.86 volts. Now let's bring in our equation in case you forgot about it. So I'll put this down here in the lower right corner, and now let's bring up our calculator. So we're going to type in 47.86, and then we're going to divide that by the square root of 2, which approximately equals 1.414. If we look at the voltage, we can see that we got 33.84 volts, and you can see that we are very close to what our voltage reading was on the voltmeter. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at the um, let's take a look at the B channel. Now, the B channel is the one which is used for the um, for the headlight circuits. Again, this is when it was at idle. This is at wide open throttle, and and uh, this is back to idle again. Again, it looks just like it did with the previous one. So let's take a look at that. Let's see if I can get a look at the waveform. You can see it's another AC, and we can check to make sure that it looks symmetrical like the other one. And as you can see, it is. Let's go back to the full screen again. And now let's bring down the voltage cursor, and then let's see if I can get that right on there somewhere. That looks pretty good. Okay, so we got 20.41 volts, and we're going to bring up our calculator again. And we're going to bring our photo in also, so we can compare that. So you should be having a photo now, and it looks like we got 14.83 volts on that one, and our RPM was running at 32 30 RPM. So 20.41 divided by 1.414 and we see that we have 14.43 volts. So we're very close to, to the voltage reading on that one also. Okay, so now let's take a look at um, A and now we want to take a look at this one here. Do you remember where I talked about uh, subtracting the voltages like for, say from peak to peak well so that's what we have right here so we have a subtraction between this signal and this signal here so again let's go down and let's get it oh, right across the peak get it lined up as close as I can it looks about oh, I'd say about right there all right Again, we're going to take a quick look at our measurements, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring the photograph in for that. And and by the way, uh, this here for the scope is um, if you measure with your voltmeter between the red and the black leads, then this is what you could should get, which is 40 around 48.68 volts is what I measured. We had an RPM of 32.40, so we take 68. 0.11 volts is our peak divided by 1.414 and you can see that we have a 48.17 rounded off so again we're very close to our reading on the voltmeter now I should point out that picoscope the software can actually do these measurements for you instead of us doing them manually so if I was to bring in a time cursor place it here well, we'll place it here. We'll let Picoscope figure out between these two time cursors what is what is actually the RMS voltage for us. So if we come down here, click on the measurement. Yep, we have the A, A waveform. We're looking at ACRMS, and we want to see what it is between the rulers. And if we look, we got 32.43 volts. Yeah, it's a little bit off, but uh, you know it's close enough. Uh, you know, to our measurements that what we had, which was uh, 33.96 volts. All right, so we looked at all the voltages here. Now let's take a look at the frequency. And we're going to be focusing here at a wide open condition. Remember, the frequency is going to be higher here than it will be at an idle. So let's bring in our time cursor, and we're going to let uh, Picoscope figure it out for us first, and then we'll make a calculation. And then we'll see how close we are. All right, let's get our measurement up. Right there. And let's get frequency. And we want to get it between the rulers. And we'll say OK. 
and you can see down here that it says 325.3 Hertz all right 325.3 so we're going to make a notation of that and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to close these out and now we're going to zoom in somewhere in there let's get in a little closer okay that looks pretty good now we're going to bring in our voltage cursor we'll make him zero all right now this is equation that I showed you on the whiteboard if you remember it was um, time which is in second is equal to one divided by frequency which is measured in Hertz but in this case we want to measure the time of one cycle okay and that will tell us what our frequency is so here's a new equation so we'll slide that one out and we'll bring in this one and this equation is going to be transposed and now it's going to be equal to uh, frequency is equal to one divided by time all right so let's go down here and let's uh, frame out one cycle so right in here this is where it's a zero at that point right there and let's get another one so it looks like we're gonna be oh somewhere right in there and let's zoom in just a little bit just see how close we can get this all right that looks good and that looks pretty good right there all right now let's go back so I have framed out from here that's a half a cycle here's the other half a cycle so that is one cycle now from here to here across that cycle this is the amount of time so this is the amount of time it takes for one cycle now if we look up here we can see that is going to be 3.079 milliseconds all right so let's get our calculator we're going to bring him up all right so we're going to say we want frequency so we're saying one divided by our time but time is measured in seconds so we have to take this here decimal point that's up here the measurement we have to shift it over to the left three places to get it into seconds so let's see one two three and zero seven nine let's make sure I'm right yep that looks good to me so that's in seconds and then we're going to see what that's equal to and as you can see that's 324.78 Hertz and picoscope calculated 325.3 so we're very close okay that is going to conclude this video the number two video and in the next one, we will be looking at the DC output and we will focus a little bit on the diode.